My biggest fear would be when the first comes and I don't get the rent. I found that my tenant had dumped concrete down my toilet. Can you believe Fair Housing fined me $5,000 for that? How do you onboard your tenants? What do you do? I don't even know if I do it right. If you're a landlord, don't just rent, rent perfect. The Rent Perfect Podcast with property expert and private investigator, David Pickron. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, David Pickron here with Rent Perfect. Have a friend of mine here. We've been working quite many years together. Tom Chase, how are you? I'm doing good, David. Tom, I, I appreciate it. I mean, you've just got years and years of investing experience. And sometimes I just love to have investors come on here and just kind of talk about during their life, how they've kind of moved through the investment world and how it's changed for them and how they kept finding success no matter what they did. So give us just kind of a really brief rundown, a little bit about who you are, what you do, and kind of, you know, your life experiences a little bit and investing before we get rolling. Okay, we'll do that. Um, you know, my first investment was very strategic. When my wife found a new house she wanted, and uh -huh. we couldn't sell the other one. So we became landlords. Uh. <laughs> and that's how we got started. Well, what a great way, <laughs> right? Uh, Buy the new one, keep the old one, and rent it out. I think that's a very good strategy, actually. Well, we, we didn't plan it that way. It kind of happened. And uh, that's how we first started investing, and that was in the late 90s. Okay. Uh, I was still in corporate America. I was very fortunate. had a great career in corporate America. 95% of the time, I liked what I did. But I, I knew it probably wasn't going to get me where I wanted to be. Right, so retirement comes. so you're one of those who jumped out later in life and decided to jump into this this investment absolutely. world. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So um, we um, we we actually kept that home for probably about three or four years, and then I bought a couple of other rental homes. Never owned multiple rental homes, just right. trying to you know make a little cash flow. And uh, did you have some good tenants in there? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I never had any issues at that time. Back then, I didn't know about you yet. Right. right so right. they weren't quite as good as they you are got now. lucky there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm glad that you had that good experience. Because sometimes yeah. if people have a bad experience from the very first rental, they don't go on to two, three, four, and they kind of say, "Yeah, this is this is for the bees." So yeah, awesome. Yeah. So we um, uh, when the when the market was going nuts here in Phoenix in uh, 2005, 6, 7. They had the good old days before the rough times, well, right? Well, it was, it was, to me, it was good old days, but it was a little scary, too. Yeah. And at the time, I, I, you know, I was very involved with ASRIA, the Arizona Real Estate Investors Association. So being involved in that, we, we got to see the numbers and what was actually right. happening. So we had information to help us navigate through that. Right. And my navigation was... I was scared because I didn't think it could sustain. So I went to Texas and bought uh, rental homes in Texas. Okay. A boring market. Okay. Oh, yeah. It doesn't move much. <laughs> at yeah. that time, it yeah. didn't. Yeah. It's different now. And I'm originally from Texas. My brother lived there, so I had some boots on the ground. There. Awesome. So, so we did that. And then as my corporate career was coming to an end and – May I could share a little story with you. Um, this was 2011, and my wife and I were on vacation in Savannah, Georgia. Very okay. beautiful place to go. And my cell phone rang, and I looked down, and it was our divisional VP calling me. And I said, well, it must be important if he's calling me on right. vacation. So right. what he did, he called me to let me know there was going to be an announcement coming that our company was being purchased. Okay. And he knew this had happened to me twice before in 15 years where I was on the wrong side of that buyout. And it doesn't turn out well at the level I was at, at least, when you're on right. the wrong side. And he, he wanted to make sure that I would stay on board for the next year because it was going to be a year transition. A transition yeah. And he said, I'll pay you a bonus at the end of that year if you stay on board. And so I would have stayed without the bonus. I respect Take him the there. bonus. Well, I did. Invest it. <laughs> well, did, exactly. And, um, but mm -hmm. what that did, it triggered when we got home. My wife and I sat down at the dining room table and had one of those gut-wrenching conversations. Right. Literally, I was early 60s then. Right. Too young to retire. Too much energy to retire. But I didn't know what I was going to do to make up for some lost time. Right. And that, that's kind of the discussion without getting into a lot of the details. Right. Um, 
about that same time, uh, you know, I've always been a learner. I've always studied things, read things, and uh, I had read Lonnie Scruggs' book, Deals on Wheels. It's about how he would buy cheap mobile homes and and create notes on them. Right. You know, do the financing. I couldn't get into to that, but what I got into was the concept. Right. The concept of I can be the bank. I right. like that. Right. And so it's the right side. Yeah. Uh-huh. And and with that conversation I said that's the focus I want to take. So I decided to focus and I started out in the promissory note investing business okay. buying notes from hard money lenders for they, for specifically mobile homes then or no, for No, it was, no, I, I wanted nothing to do with mobile okay. homes at that time. <laughs> so okay. uh, but the concept uh, th- these hard money lenders would lend to guys who would do fix and flip and then I would buy the note. Right. They're making 10 to 12% of the right. money, you know. Right. Um, and it's secured by an investment. So it, it allowed me to kind of tiptoe into the water, you right. know. And I was able to uh uh, learn a few things, and, okay. and uh, like in the early days, we were doing it with our, our IRA, and when you do short-term lending, you got in and out fees. So right. those in and out fees were eating up a little right. bit of profit. So, so, so as you start doing things, and you, you, you learn, right. and, I, and I've always, I've always felt the best teacher is action. Yeah, experience. Yeah, right. Take the action. Yeah. Absolutely. You can talk about it all you want, but if you don't, you're not going to learn. You know, as I talk to a lot of investors, I think that's true. No matter what, you know, what investment that they're in, whether it's on the funding side, the lending side, the buying side, long term, short term, the smart investor is always learning and they're almost always a risk taker. So they jump in and maybe they don't make a lot of money on the first deal. Maybe the first deal is the educational deal, right? You pay your um, tuition. Yeah, so <laughs> so my, my son, you know, when he went to buy his first fip, uh, fix and flip, he went down to Wilcox down by Tucson, right? I know where south that's of at. You. My dad lived and there. And he's like, Dad, do you want to come look at this property with me? Now, he's 21 years old. You would think that dad would say, let me go down there with you, son, uh, and, and look at it. But I said, no. You go, you go decide whether you want that. It was 50000 bucks, so I knew you couldn't get in too much trouble. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a lot of money, but in the real estate world. Right. And uh, so he came back. He says, Dad, I'm, I'm going to buy this. And I'm like, really? I didn't ask a lot of questions because I actually knew with my history and my knowledge, I probably wouldn't have bought it, but I didn't want to talk him out of it. So I said, you know what? There's no college or university for investors. So, son, go in learn everything you can that you didn't properly check the roof. You didn't check the air conditioning. You didn't, you know, and it took him a year, year and a half to finally turn that property because we had a hard time finding contractors down in Wilcox, which is Mm -hmm. a small town outside of Tucson, if you guys know. But man, he came out of that. I think he made like 9,000 bucks for a year and a half worth of work, which which wasn't really (laughs) a good return on investment, right? But the knowledge he gained out of doing all of that stuff and, and learning all that, it was priceless. I couldn't have taught him any of that. And so my point is, is, is sometimes you got to jump into it, learn it, perfect it, and then the money starts coming. So, exactly. Yeah. You know, I come from actually, which is crazy <coughs> the way I am, I come from parents who were scared to do anything. Anytime I jump into something new, my mom or dad in a conversation will say, are you sure you want to do that? You, you know, it doesn't sound like that. I mean, they are like the naysayers. I love them to death. Mom and dad love you to death. But I'm the risk taker of the family. Mm-hmm. And and I've lost some. There's no doubt. I'm not going to tell you I'm 100%. But I've also done very well. So my wins way outweigh my, my losses. And that's what I learned as I talked to a lot of investors is it's the learning of the game, right? Anybody can get into buying notes, but the person who does it right is the one who learns the game and understands it and realizes the in and out fees on our IRA are killing me. So I've got to find another way to do it. Right. Right. Mm. Okay. So you, d- you did that. And then <coughs> what'd you do after that? Well, as I, uh, uh the, the corporate America, uh, life came to an end. Kay. And I always like to say it was nice because I got paid to stay Kay. and then I got paid to leave exactly <laughs> by the people who bought us. So, so we had a little nest egg and, and, uh, I, I knew I wanted to perfect this being the bank. 
So I just started buying longer term notes. I started okay. looking for notes to to buy and purchase people who had created seller finance notes. Right. I did some mailings. I'm not a big mailer. Right. I mean, a lot of people do that, but I, I to me, I don't have the patience, you know, right. to mail out a thousand letters and hopefully get 10 calls. Right, right. You know, and nine of them are, right. you know, it just doesn't fit me well. Right. So, so how I did is I did a ton of networking. Okay. Uh, very involved with ASRIA, as I okay. mentioned, since 2005. Arizona Real Estate Investment Association. Right. We always recommend that you guys get to your local real estate investment associations. There are so many great stories there. No. And... Um, I've got a great story I'll share with you. Okay, uh, love it. On that. So I, st- I got involved with ASRI in 2005, well before this okay. this trip in 2011 I told you about. And and the market was just insane here with uh, the prices going up and people buying something and flipping it in three months and saying, I'm an investor. Right, I just exactly. made a lot of money. Right. You know, you're a speculator who got lucky. <laughs> right, no. <laughs> you know? so, yeah, you couldn't have pulled that off in 2009, 2010. Yeah, no. But you could do it in 2005, exactly. <laughs> and and I was I was smarter than that, I thought. Uh-huh. Okay. But I got caught up, and I, I decided to build a almost million-dollar spec home. This home was going to be about 950000 by the yeah, time. Back in 2005? That's yep. yeah. That's a two point five three million dollar home today in yeah. equivalent, yeah. right? So it was so down. It's a big project. It was a big project, and what kind of experience did I have? A zilch. <laughs> Except my ego. Hey, plug your nose and jump, <laughs> man. Just plug your nose and jump. So okay. so I bought the, the property alone was a two and a half acre parcel. It was in a gated okay. community in Vale, which is south okay. of Tucson. Really beautiful area down there. We started developing for the, the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And I went to an ASRIA meeting, and Alan Langston, who has since sold the company, but he was mm-hmm. uh, uh, started uh, ASRIA. Love Alan. And, yeah, me too, a special friend. Um, and he always does the market update, and he showed us the market update. We could see the top. We could see it happening. Did we have any idea it was going to do this? No, but we saw the slowing. We saw the slowing right. of everything. And, and, and the signs were there. It was like it was like driving down a road and looking at the road signs. And not to interrupt you, but I kind of feel that's where we're at today. We're seeing yeah. the slowing. And I've been here before, and I've seen the cycle. Mm-hmm. So I saw what happened in 08, 09, and I'm thinking, are we there again today? So you're at this is RIA meeting. As if you were there today, you're seeing the signs on the wall. You've got a million-dollar project, and what do you do? So at that point, I decided it's going to be a year before I finish this project. Yeah. Where's the market going to be then? That's right. what scared me. So I decided to put the property that I had on the market and sell it, and I advertised. Motivated seller. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I lost $10,000. You gained a ton, I'm telling I you. I gained a ton. <laughs> Today, how many years later, over a decade later, those homes still have not come back up to that value. I would have gone bankrupt if I had made that decision. Yeah. So That's being involved in as So we, we thank Alan for giving that information to us, but it's really the information that saved us. So in a way, as an investor, we can, no matter what we're investing in, we're really predicting the future. Right, because if we know that the economy is going down, we're not going to spend a million dollars on a project that's going to be worth five hundred thousand. That's a terrible investment. Right. Exactly. But sometimes we don't hit it exactly right, and it's hard to predict what's going to happen. You would not have known, like you just said in two thousand five, two thousand six, where you were going to be in a year. If you would have known that, and that would have been just common knowledge, there's no way in the world you would even bought that two and a half acres. Correct. Correct. So, yeah. part of being an investor is actually getting as much information. I mean, you should be, if you're not a researcher, like I'm a private investigator, if you don't just love to fill your brain up with just stuff, if you're not learning, engaged around people doing the same thing, taking in market research, looking at the news cycle, looking at um, the history of the United States and and it's going up and it's down and it's cycles, um, you need to take all of that in. That's part of the reason we do this podcast is we just get information, information, information. Some of it you have to sift through. It's boring. It doesn't have anything to do with you. Mm -hmm. But you'll catch these nuggets. You'll catch Alan Langston in 2005 saying, hey, guys, we're the top of the market, right? He did the same thing for me in 2014. I was going to buy a home. um, 
it was like 87 bucks a foot. Now, today, we'd be like, can I buy five of those, you know, 10 of those? Right. But back then, it was, wow, that's kind of pushing the market, and I wasn't really sure. And he's like, guys, if you can get anything in the 80s right now, buy it. I text my real estate agent right then. I said, buy that property. You know, I sold that four or five years later for like close to $350,000 profit. You know, nice. so I tell Alan, I owe you some money on that one. So we, we, I love having you here because you're really showing us we need to listen to this information process and make the best call that we possibly can do. Um, okay, so let's fast forward now, Tom. So now you're today, what are you doing today as you've kind of woven through this kind of investment world of funding? Where are you at today? So, so today, I, uh, I started buying notes. I don't, let me go back mm -hmm. on, on real estate. I mean, about 2016, I had a number of investors, probably about 15, 20 investors who depended on us to find those notes for them. So when you're buying notes from somebody else, there's always something you don't know. I don't care how good your due diligence is. There's something you're going to miss. Is, there, is that because there's a reason that note's on the market to buy? Is that Yeah, it's always a question. Why are you selling the note? Right. You know, think about it. A note investor, most of them won't sell their best note. No. They won't. So, so you've got to really do your due diligence. And I was very focused in Arizona, which limited things. Okay. I wouldn't go to other markets that I didn't understand. So I started thinking, I've got to... I've got to find a way to think like a manufacturer. Okay. So, okay. If I'm manufacturing widgets, my widgets happen to be notes secured okay. by a home. Right. If I'm buying those widgets, say, from somewhere overseas, I can't control the quality coming right. in. Right. But if I can make those widgets, now I can control the quality. So I started thinking about my note business that way. Okay. And about that same time, I bought my first note on a manufactured home that was not real estate it's in a land lease community okay that's where the people own the home but they don't own the land that it sits on they so it would it be more considered like a vehicle then it, it exactly is treated that way okay yeah it uh, so I, it's I, a residence but it's really not attached to a property so it's sitting in a park where you're loaning on almost a home but it's not attached to land. So is that risky? Well, everything is risky, okay? <laughs> <laughs> there is no risk-free in anything. Dang it. <laughs> Dang it. I was hoping I found something new today. <laughs> so, um, but uh, one, of, one of the things we, we and I'm, I'm going to fast forward and I'm going to come back a little okay. bit, but today we have expanded that business and we only lend in the upper tier communities. Okay. When I say upper tier communities, we developed our own rating system to rate manufactured home communities, much like the grading system we had in school, A, B, C, mm -hmm. D, and mm -hmm. F. We only lend in A and B communities. Okay. Why? Because they drive the value. I, I mean, we know in real estate, neighborhoods drive the value, but it's even more so in the manufactured home community. So generally, most of the communities that we work in, they're gated. They have nice amenities. A lot of them are 55-plus retirement communities. People are downsizing, moving into these. It's a lifestyle. And when they rent that space to put their home on, it's not just the space. They're paying for all the amenities. So think of it as a, mm -hmm. an HOA. Right. Of That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we just lend on the home. They own the home. And I know some people say, well, yeah, that's risky because they can move that home any time. These homes don't move. How many times do you see one of those homes on a truck going down the road? No. Not very often. A and when you're a lien holder, there are laws. Uh, a, a licensed mover can't move it without notifying the lien okay. holder. Gotcha. There's all kinds so of protections. So there's protections. some protections. Okay. Yeah, in there. So that just doesn't happen. And it probably costs five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to yes. move one of those. Yes. Right? It's not cheap. It's not like <laughs> driving your car down the street. Exactly. Okay. exactly. And the older the home is, there's some other things that come into play that you have to go through the state and get some right. special licensing. And it, it's just very difficult. So if I understand you correctly, instead of buying notes that already were e existing notes, you're now creating the note Correct. at the very beginning. You're, you see who the person who's lending the money, you get to qualify them. You have a lot more say in, in where you've gone now than where you used to be just buying a note. Exactly. When, 
when we originate the note, we know everything about the community, the home, the borrower. And so when an investor who, who funds that or buys those notes, whatever question they have, we can answer it. Right. It, it, there, there's no mysteries out there. And the way our business is set up, we make our money from the transaction side of the business. Okay. And our investor gets the returns on the loan. Okay. So why am I not buying those notes from you, Tom? I don't know. Why aren't you? Probably because oh. I haven't told you about it. <laughs> there you go. See, now here's, here's where I go from long term. I move into short term. I have some commercial. And now here's where I'm saying my mind's picking up this information saying, hey, these are good notes that are really backed by, we're saying not a home attached to a property, but someone's home still. I mean, it's the most major investment in their lives, right? This is a, this yeah. is a good investment to get into, is what I think. Absolutely. If you, if you, if you look at, nothing's recession, folks. Okay. Right. Maybe, maybe dying is, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but if, if the housing markets get hit, gets hit people still need to live in a place Absolutely. so they're going to move down so to speak right so but it sounds to me like you're buying a and b so you still have nice places yeah but they're on the lower end of costs so yeah right? of the housing market so are you still under a hundred thousand dollars most times in a mobile home or are they kind of reaching that levels or they're reaching that level now when we when we created the new company in 2017, okay. Affordable Housing Loans, to do loans on manufactured homes. At that time, after we did our research, after buying mm -hmm. those notes, we found that the 50000 and below market was not served well at all by lenders. Okay. And, it, and, and I want to make a, make a point to that. We didn't go into this saying, ooh, we can make a lot of money. We went in and said there's a market not being served. Okay. How do we serve that market better? The money will come if you do it right. right. And right. how do we serve our investors? And then we found out, wow, the communities need our help too because it was basically a cash business. The longer they're sitting on that home and not selling, the longer they're not getting revenue for their space rent. Right. So, so we, we developed a win-win-win scenario. Right. You know, it's what we did. And so we, we, we started doing those loans. And we've got a little different model than a traditional lender. You know, um, a traditional lender generally makes their money from uh, origination points and right. fees and things like that. Well, at those small numbers, you know, then, okay, today the market's a little different, and right. I'll get to that, but you just couldn't make enough money to make it work. So I, I am a licensed lender. Okay. okay. Um, so we also went and got our license to be a manufactured home reseller and dealer. Okay. Uh, so the way our business model works is, let's say a home is 50000 First of all, we don't just underwrite the borrower. In our business, we've got to underwrite the deal. Okay. That involves, it's got to be in one of our approved communities. If it's not an approved community, it doesn't matter how nice the home is or how good the borrower is. And those approved communities have requirements of the person who's going to move in there, Correct. meaning they need a background check, credit I check, all that stuff. That's where we cross paths, right? Right, and, I, and uh -huh. we do that to you. So we, we know from when we get the report from you whether they're going to have an issue being approved in that community or right. not. Right, right. You know, because we know that. So so we moved we moved forward then, go back to the $50,000 home. It's an approved community. We, we, we inspect the home. We make sure the home is in, in good shape. There are some homeowners and rehabbers out there who will do a rehab and cover up issues. We gotcha. know how to find those. Gotcha. Because we're in the business. Right. And we know how to find those. And then we qualify the borrower. So once we have that borrower qualified, we go to that seller and say, we have a qualified borrower. We're going we're gonna to fund them. That's a deal with us. Right. We're going to make you a cash offer for that house on their behalf because we're a dealer. Right. So we try to get that home at around forty five, forty six thousand, dollars okay. but our buyer's paying fifty. Right. With the finance grant. We have all the disclosures. Right. No, absolutely. The, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's how we found we can make money. And then our investors, we have, we have an investor group called the Passive Income Network. Okay. And we've got about 44 investors in that group. When we have- a 45. Deal, 40 45, yeah. me, 
at oh, me today. Okay. 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 All, All right. right. <laughs> There's a couple of 45. <laughs> that, that went over my head for a moment. <laughs> so, I'm begging to get into an investment group. Uh, so they will fund the deal. Okay. So when they fund the deal with us, uh, let's say we're, we're, we're paying the 45, investor funds the deal, and then we pay the investor an interest only for six months. It's a promissory note from us Kay. back to you. If that borrower doesn't pay us, we're still obligated to pay you. Gotcha. The way that is. Once we create the note with the borrower, we season that or have the payment history of six months. Okay. Then at that point, you who funded it have the first right to own that to note. To buy that note, right. And your interest rate goes up and your cash flow goes up. But you're passive, so we still service it for you. We track insurance. We track taxes. If they don't pay, we're the ones calling them. We're knocking on the door. If it has to be taken back, which we have taken back very few, three in five years. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And so, so that's, that's how our model works. It's a totally different model. So I've got a few minutes left. I guess I want to I say, where do you think what you're doing, where is it going now if we think the economy is going to come a little bit? And I'm not predicting a huge crash. It could happen, but I do know it's slowing. So where do you see yourself going? Do you, do you like investors to switch to the note side? Do you think that's a safer side? Do you, tell me what you think. Well, Give I me think that knowledge, Tom. Give I me that knowledge. You know, it depends on where you're at in life. At the point where I'm at in life, I like boring, nice cash flow. Okay. And when I take my money and put it out there, I think of uh, their little soldiers okay. or their little workers, and I want something coming back. Right, you're That's leveraging. That's why I right. like the note business. When I put the money out, next month I'm getting a check. Right. Checks are coming in or direct deposit. You know, checks I'm dating myself. Exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, so, and it's one of the best retirement investments you can use. We have a lot of our investors who use their 401k, their IRAs to invest in. What, what's nice is the risk. You talked about risk mm -hmm. earlier. What's the risk? Well, they quit paying. Something happens. You know, they lose a job, the divorce, the things that happen, and they quit paying. But you've got a hard asset that's security for your investment. So it's all about uh, return of your capital instead of return right. on capital. Right. And in Arizona, I think you go through a re repossession, right? Yeah. And more of a, a, a automobile repossession than you have to go through a whole foreclosure. Correct. It's not a foreclosure. Right, right. And because we work so closely with the community, if the borrower is not paying us, they're generally not paying their the space, space rent. rent. Right. Then the community will go through an eviction to evict them. So That's you don't even have to do that. No, we we may if we if we repossess it and they're still in the house and right. we can't get them out, then we would have to go through an eviction. Right. But most cases, the community's taking care of that, and we and the communities are really our partners in this deal. They're referring the borrowers to us. Right. We, when we take that back and now we own the home and resell it, we're making sure we're going to make them whole on what they have coming to. It's all part of that awesome. collaboration. Tom, what I love about today is you've just you've opened my world up to a whole different part of investing. I never claim to know it all. I love to have guests like you who show me different ways to, to make money off of my money. And maybe a different part of your life or or maybe do this on the side and diversify a little bit. So I really appreciate you coming. Um, we're going to talk more for sure because I want to I wanna get involved in something like this. If there's room for me, I'm sure you have investors lined up out the door on this but I'm going to beat you up until you let me in. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody does have any questions or want to contact you, how? what's the best way to contact you? Uh, you can contact me through our uh, affordable housing loans company. Okay. We have a website, ahlaz.com. Okay, ahlaz.com. Correct. Our phone number is 602-283-4813. And my email is T Chase C H A S E at A H L A Z dot com. I love it. You know, you looked at an underserved community here in Arizona. There's probably underserved communities in every state in this nation, and uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Any last words to add? Uh, we are doing Vegas too. We do work in Vegas. You're jumping over into Nevada. We we've been there for three years now. So okay. So awesome. we we you're right about other areas. Uh, with the right general 
partners, or maybe general partners, not the term, but with the right people to work with in different markets, we want to spread this to other markets. But I've always said, and when people ask me, what's the most important part of a deal you should look at? I say it's not the deal at all. It's who are you doing the deal who with. Who are you doing the deal so with. So who we expand right. with is important. So who are you guys working with? Well, we got to wrap this up. We're out of time. Tom, thank you so much for coming. And until next time, continue to rent perfect. <laughs>